Welcome to Bicom this weekly podcast. Um, my name is James Serene, the Bicom CEO. We are delighted this week to have a bumper edition of the Bicom podcast, which is looking at all issues related to Iran, the Iran nuclear deal, and rising tensions between the US uh, and Iran in the Middle East. Um, this is linked to a paper um, that Bicom published um, today called Britain's Iran Dilemma. And I'm delighted to be joined on the line by the author of the paper who's been working away on this for the last few weeks, Dr. Toby Green. Um, good afternoon, Dr. Green. Good afternoon, James. Nice to speak with you. Thank you for being here. Um, so my, my first question, uh, as we try and explore with a number of experts over this podcast, is, is what do we actually um, think is a, a potential UK role within this sort of era of high tension. We've got the US pushing for um, uh, uh, escalating um, sanctions against Iran. It's saying that it doesn't want war, it wants Iran to come back to the table and I suppose essentially improve on the original nuclear agreement. You've got the UK stuck in the middle between the US and the other European powers involved, Germany and France. But from writing this report and the recommendations you came up with, well, what do you see that is the key potential role for the UK here now in the next few months? Well, look, it's not easy. I mean, part of what motivated writing this paper was the obvious fact that this is an uncomfortable reality for the UK. But the question is, can you can the, the British government and British diplomats somehow play a bridging role? Because we started this paper even before the crisis became acute in the last couple of months, because it was very clear that the current reality uh, is a very awkward one for, for, for Britain. Once the United States pulled out of the deal, the UK found itself working with France and Germany to try and undermine sanctions that the United States, Britain's you know, closest strategic partner, uh, was, was putting in place. And since aligning itself not only with France and Germany, but in a way with Russia and China, trying to prop up a deal, working against the policy of the United States. That's always a very awkward position for Britain to be in, not least in the context of Brexit. And on, on the, other, the other aspect of this um, dilemma is, if you look in the, in the long run, you know, there's there's every reason to think that those who um, criticised the deal uh, and feared that in the long term it would not prevent Iran uh, gaining the capability to acquire nuclear weapons, the evidence of the last few years, uh, regrettably, seems to reinforce that uh, that conclusion. So for those two reasons, there seems to be a, a conundrum or a paradox with British policy. And so we're trying to figure out a, a way of if, if that, that paradox can be resolved somehow. And, and yes, the bottom line is trying to find a way to uh, realign uh, uh, transatlantic policy to narrow the gap between where the United States is and where uh, the European powers are currently are and reorientate the policy uh, towards the real long-term goal, which is making sure Iran can never have the capacity for nuclear weapons and also trying to contain its troubling regional behaviour. So you, you're a sort of long-time analyst of, of, of UK foreign policy. And, and I just wanted to ask, have you detected a slight shift in the UK on, on this issue? Like it seemed a few years ago that, you know, when we had the JCPOA signed and, and Britain was very much, you know, one of the cheerleaders along with the US, uh, along with this idea that potentially this was going to lead to a, a real change, um, not just in what exactly the Iranian regime was doing vis-a-vis -a, -vis a nuclear program, but also a, a wider change of policy uh, and more moderation. And, and the UK was very much sort of singing the praises of the JCPOA as not just an arms limitation treaty, but also something that would really push um, the, the Iranian regime in a different direction. It seems in the last year, I don't know if you'll agree with me, that there's a bit more of an edge to UK policy on Iran. And we can see that in um, some of the action at the Security Council against Iranian ballistic missiles. Um, UK was one of a number of countries that called in um, uh, Iranian ambassadors to talk about uh, assassination plots on European soil. Um, it agreed in February this year to ban all of Hezbollah, which is one of the key sort of Iranian allies. Um, and it does seem to be talking a little bit more about being on the side of Gulf allies, you know, even a few years ago, we had Theresa May saying, you know, that, that the UK was very clear eyed on Iran and, um, you know, Gulf security was the UK security. I mean, have you detected a shift or you, do you just think it's sort of moving with the weather of some of the Trump administration and sort of trying to be in both camps? I think that we've been through several phases for several different reasons. I think back in the early years of the Obama administration, the United Kingdom was actually one of the leading players pushing for a tougher line on Iran. And it was taking a leading role, including in certain aspects of sanctions 
uh, sanctions policy, um, you know, what, what, and, um, and, and pushing for, for a tougher line. And in the end, we did get an Obama uh, uh, and a Clinton, uh, Hillary Clinton strategy of, of, of biting sanctions, which led to the position of negotiations. Then I think what happened was once the U.S. kind of took the lead on sanctions and then took the lead in the negotiation process, once negotiations began, uh, you know, Kerry and Obama were very, very keen to get a deal. And I think that the deal that they got in the end, many criticised as being not strong enough. But I think that Britain found itself in a position whereby it was not going to be holier than the Pope in the sense that the United States was willing to, to cut this deal, albeit given its weaknesses, the UK wasn't going to try and, uh, you know, it wasn't obviously going to reject reject that deal and reject the concessions that the Americans were willing to make. What's happened since then, I think, is obviously uh, one dimension of what's happened with UK policy is Brexit has sucked all the energy out of British diplomacy. It means Britain mm -hmm. cannot be uh, as proactive and leading a player as it might otherwise be because it just doesn't have the kind of capacity and energy. So it's become, I think, a little bit more uh, passive. That said, it has still kind of um, pulled some levers, and you gave the, the Hezbollah um, uh, uh, sanctions uh, example, but I think it, it's not been taking a leading role in trying to address the central issue, which is how to uh, reorientate transit, you know, transatlantic alignment uh, united around the goal of preventing Iran getting nuclear weapons, and that's difficult for Britain to do given its current you know internal political issues with respect to Brexit but what we're trying to say here is it's really important to try uh, mm. uh, if possible. There's a lot of discussion about the three different objectives here vis-a-vis -vis Iran policy so so ultimately the UK wants to stop Iran acquiring a nuclear weapon it wants to um, in some ways restrain uh, tackle combat what they call destabilizing uh, regional activities by Iran, by which they normally mean support of proxies all over the region, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Houthis in Yemen, uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad and Hamas in, in, in Gaza. Um, and uh, also, of course, it, it, its role in Syria with some of the militias there. Uh, so that's a second part. And then, and then a third part is its advanced ballistic missile program. Now, Given the work that you've done and, and the exploration of all the issues, do you think it's achievable, even in the sort of medium and long term, that America, UK and others can actually tackle all three issues? Or is it going to be the case that one of them is going to be, you know, somehow looked over? Do you think it's even an achievable objective? All of these are very, very uh, uh, severe challenges. It's not clear to me that all of them can be addressed in some kind of one grand bargain. The decision yeah. that, um, uh, that the Obama administration made was to make a deal that addressed the nuclear pro nuclear issue and put the other issues on the side. It doesn't mean that you um, then forget about what Iran's destabilizing, uh, other destabilizing policies. Uh, it, it may be that for, with all the will in the world, it, it's not possible to, to sort of put all those issues in one basket. As Mike Pompeo tried to do with his list of 12 demands on Iran, it may, this is one of the issues that needs to be determined between uh, Britain, France and Germany and the United States. Can those goals be distilled into, on the one hand, perhaps a renewed negotiation strategy if um, Iran is willing to engage directly or indirectly with the United States? And on the other hand, a strategy to contain these other problematic behaviours. It, it, it may be more realistic that they have to be addressed in, in, in different ways, some through negotiation, some through uh, uh, pressure and containment. But what I think is central for UK policymakers to understand is how significant these issues are. On the one hand, the discovery of a secret uh, Iranian nuclear archive in 2018 by Israeli intelligence reveals the fact that not only did Iran want to develop the technology to build nuclear weapons, they actually had at least in, uh, up until 2003, a concrete plan to build five bombs. And the evidence is absolutely there in, in, in the documents. And the fact that they kept that archive secretly hidden, even after the JCPOA, reveals that they at least had the intent to retain the capabilities to do that. And we see other regional activities, which are also obviously extremely um, uh, problematic, his interventions and, and, and role in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and also particularly the, the proliferation of precision missile technology, which is kind of game changing uh, if it's proliferating that technology to regional proxies. And that's happening right now. So the nuclear weapons threat, OK, that's still a few years down the line, but not many years. But the proliferation of pre precision missile technology, which is also very, very destabilizing and other actions of Iran, they, those are happening right, right now. So I think it is key to, to, to not uh, take the eye off the ball on these issues. 
Yeah. And just my final question is, I mean, having now done this project and the papers being published, I wonder if you could just reflect on, you know, what was what was the one big thing that really struck you about, you know, exploring this in detail? What, what, what was the one big revelation that you want to share? Well, I think the contents uh, of the uh, of that secret nuclear archive that, that the Moss that the Moss had uh, uh, retrieved in an extraordinary, uh, you know, uh, uh, heist operation fit for a Hollywood movie from a Tehran uh, uh, a garage, uh, and what it reveals, you know, it really underlines um, uh, how troubling um, uh, Iran's nuclear program is, and how problematic the JCPO is, and how quickly time is, is running out in that sense. Yeah. Can I just stop you there? Because I just yeah. think it's worth making the point for our listeners that, you know, when that archive um, was revealed and when Benjamin Netanyahu did his big sort of set piece on TV and he had all the files behind him and everything, there was a lot of cynicism. And I remember, you know, a lot of journalists who've been studying this for a long time, you know, saying on Twitter, you know, what's new? We knew all of this. This is there's no new evidence that the um, Iranian regime has violated the JCPOA since 2015, but in many ways they were kind of looking in the wrong place. And I think what's important about what, you, what you're saying and what you've written in the paper is that it's not about violations since 2015. It's about the intent before that and leading up to JCPOA negotiations that the archive proves yeah. that they were trying to re really go all out for a, a nuclear weapon and kept all the plans to do it. And I, yeah, if you want to carry on with that, but that, that's, that's something really worth reflecting on. That's right. I'm not sure the way that Netanyahu revealed the archive was necessarily mm. the strongest in, in terms of, uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, gaining international credibility for its significance. But now we're a year on and independent experts have had the opportunity to look at a lot of the contents of that archive. David Albright, um, of, uh, 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 one of the leading um, independent experts on uh, proliferation in Washington, a group of experts um, commissioned by the Belfer Center, uh, also in the US have gone through those documents and, and looked at them and their conclusion is, okay, a lot of this we, we, we knew or we suspected, but now it's put it beyond doubt and in some cases strengthened what we knew and firmed up the suspicion that Iran not only had the designs fully completed to build a bomb, but actually had a plan to build uh, uh, five bombs. And the very fact that the archive exists it undermines, all, in, you know, David Albright has written, you know, this calls into question the whole basis of, of, of the JCPOA. The very first line, essentially, the JCPOA is Iran saying, we never have, we will promise never to build nuclear weapons. That's totally inconsistent with retaining a nuclear archive full of information, including designs on how to build nuclear weapons. So it reveals the fact that the fact is the JCPOA is built on a fiction. Now, many of the powers who signed that agreement understood that. They knew mm. Iran had lied, had not come clean, but they accepted that that was part, you know, basically brushing that under the carpet was part of the price to pay to kick the can 10, 15 years down the road. But with five years on, Iran's behavior hasn't really changed. It's clearly retained the technology and capacity and wants to retain the abilities at the very least to build nuclear weapons should it want to do so. And we have to look at that reality. And that means, OK, it's important to try and defuse the acute crisis happening right now uh, in the Gulf. But it's also important to look clear eyed long term at where we're going to be in five years time, 10 years time with respect to Iran's nuclear program. And it may be that the crisis that the Trump administration has created, however off putting the Trump administration may be in its behavior and its policy and how difficult it may be for its allies to, to deal with, the crisis may create an opportunity not uh, to address the, the long term flaws that, the, that exist within the JCPOA. Thank you very much, Toby. And uh, thank you very much for, for, for writing this paper. And I should say this is this is probably what, one of the last papers you'll be writing for us for a very long time as you're taking up a new post at, at Queen Mary uh, College at the University of London in a few weeks time. So we wish you well with all of that. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Professor Ali Ansari, who's a um, professor at St Andrews University. Welcome to the podcast, Ali. Very good to be with you. Um, so really what I wanted to ask about was this mm. position we have at the moment where Britain uh, is stuck between the US and France and Germany on Iran. It's stuck in this situation where, you know, JCPOA or not to JCPOA. Yeah. What, what do you think the key priority should be for the UK when it's trying to get out of this situation? Well, whenever you look at British relations with Iran, you got to take into account the rather sort of prolonged and quite traumatic history that the two countries share. So this, on the one hand, you know, the Iranians will always berate the British for having caused all sorts of uh, 
all sorts of uh, disastrous uh, consequences in, in in Iran, and uh, and obviously we all know about the coup in nineteen fifty three, which hasn't you know which has in some ways uh, clearly scarred relations. On the other hand, uh, the depth of the relationship, which goes back much further than nineteen fifty fifty three, of course, means that Iran and, and Britain share a fairly unique relationship, mm. uh, one in which there's a lot of uh, affinity, familiarity. There's a sort of a cultural sort of understanding. In, in both directions, and certainly the, the British towards uh, the Iranians in many ways. Um, there's certainly a reservoir of knowledge, it's not always used, but there's certainly a reservoir of knowledge in this country. And there is a sort of a residual respect that the Iranians have for the British, and this is quite striking. So mm. when we talk about uh, bridge building, dialogue, and by dialogue, by the way, I don't mean a nice cup of tea. I mean, actually, sometimes these dialogues can be quite robust, and they should be, really. Um, the Iranians have always been, in some ways, more anxious, funnily enough, to sort of engage uh, with the British and then latterly the Americans. They find actually the Europeans to not be as important and influential. That may be a misreading, of course, on the Iranian part, but the fact is that that is the perception they have. So the, the British do have a role to play. The question is, as you sort of quite rightly say, is you know how we define that role really and, and where, where, where it can be played. And I think it is one in which there has to be a degree of engagement, but it has to be a, an, a well-informed and quite robust engagement that doesn't, you know, vacillate really between, on the one hand, you know, being very, very soft and wanting not to offend anyone, and on the other hand, uh, really losing sight of, of, you know, any sense of balance in any way, you know, being, being mm. very, very harsh. There has to be a sort of a balance between the two. So, so you're sort of hinting at actually the UK should see itself as perhaps more influential than perhaps it already does. Yeah. Um, so on these sort of three areas that people keep talking about, they say, look, you know, the, the UK and the US certainly want to stop Iran getting a nuclear weapon. Mm. They want to mm. deal with Iran's mm. development of more advanced ballistic missiles and they want to try and stop what they yeah. call sort of destabilizing activities in Regional the region. Regional activities, yeah. So, yeah, support for proxies. Is there any of those where actually Britain can do something about trying to engage with Iran to reduce or stop and or, or is it just the case that, in your view of what the debate is within Iran, are they never going to stop those three and going full cinema? Well, the, fir- the first thing Britain needs to have is it needs to have a very distinct policy position on Iran. I mean, yeah. the, the, You don't I, think it has it that? It doesn't then. really. No, I mean, yeah. what it does is it has a series of views. Yeah. It sort of reacts. Yeah. It's not as practical as it should be. It tends to fall under, in some ways, the shadow of the US. It, 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 it doesn't want... Obviously, it's... Its allies in Europe and the US are, you know, very clear. Clearly, it's on the JCPOA, it's it's mm. tended to move much more towards the European position than the American position. But the fact is, actually, even the Europeans themselves are very worried about the direction of travel and things are going. So there probably isn't as much difference, really, in some ways, in a practical sense between the Europeans, but certainly the British and the Americans. Everyone is concerned, shall we say, about the sort of regional mm. uh, uh, disturbances and the and the the, uh, the interference that does go on uh, with Iran. So so that's there, but. The point really about playing a distinctive role, mm. if you want to play a distinctive role, and I think Britain could play a distinctive role, it doesn't have to be massively different, but it just has to be distinctive. It does need to understand in its own mind the nature of the relationship, the history of that relationship, mm. where we are now and how we're going to take things forward and and create a little bit of clear blue water between both the Europeans and the Americans, to be honest. I mean, yeah. it needs to have a separate, a distinct uh, approach. And because of Britain's really rather unique historical relationship with Iran mm. and its sort of quite interesting cultural sort of links mm. and associations. Let's use the term the Persians, and mm. that might give a little bit more of a sense of that sort of his- historicity to it. There is, I believe, certainly a role that can be played. I think so far, the tendency has been, unfortunately, to be to be too reactive. Right. And just going on to what, what you foresee yeah. about how the Iranian regime yeah. will now behave... We've had a very strange few weeks yeah, where, yeah, yeah, yeah. on the one hand, are we going to have a war? On the other hand, yeah, you know, yeah. are there going to be talks? Do you think there is an indication there that the Iranian regime is making a decision about whether it will actually sit down and try and talk and try and do something about meeting the Americans on some of these demands? Do, do you see that happening or do you see a much greater hardening um, of the people at the top in the regime. What do you think will happen? Well, interestingly, I think ultimately, you mean, but these things are in some ways not mutually exclusive, and, mm. and let me explain what I mean by that. In some ways, you're going to see a domestic hardening of, of, of the politics, i.e. the hardliners will consolidate their position. And the more they consolidate their position, and it's a process that's been going on for some time, yeah. by the way, it's not even really related to the nuclear file at all. It's just that process of, 
of consolidating the position, the more comfortable they are in their own skin, mm. irrespective of what most Iranians feel, by the way. Ironically, and it, they, they may be more confident then to, to, to reach out in some ways in order to, to soften the impact, certainly, of these very, very um, extensive sanctions that are being inflicted. Now, here is where perhaps, and we have to caveat all these things when we talk about these things, of course, uh, where perhaps Britain can play Mm. Uh, a constructive role in terms of being able to open some of the discussions of the possibilities before any direct dialogue is conducted with the United States. My sense is that certainly the Iranians currently believe that at some stage they will need to get round the table again with the Europeans, but certainly with the Americans. I think the Europeans themselves also understand that because some of the clauses in the current JCPOA by the time, you know, in a few years' time, mm. they'll be coming to an end. Yeah, we're reaching be, that so, point. Yeah, yeah. we're reaching that point when things will have to be reviewed. So I think, I think there is uh, a general acknowledgement, even if it's not said publicly, to be honest, uh, that at some stage, around 2020, 2021, there'll have to be a, there'll have to be a review uh, and negotiations. I think what the Iranians are particularly anxious about, to be honest, is they don't want to appear to be rewarding Donald Trump for some of the rhetoric. At the same time, they look at what happened with North Korea and they think the more the rhetoric gets more, you know, wild and and, uh, um, exaggerated, the curiously, the the greater the the chance that some sort of dialogue might suddenly open up. Do do you think that there will be more of the kind of incidents we saw with the the ships near the UAE and the drones? Do you think there'll be more of that kind of testing to see how far they can sort of use proxies perhaps to sort of expose weaknesses with the US? Allies, or do you think we're done with that for now and there's now a period where it's a bit I, of a I, I think see. it's very interesting. I mean, for me, you know, that sort of behaviour is very much the modus operandi of the, yeah. the God's force. And that's, I mean, that's what the Iranians do. I mean, they were constantly seeking to provoke, push, yeah. push the boundaries of the envelope. They want to see where the limits are. I think that the problem we had was under the Obama administration, the Obama administration tended to turn a blind eye to it, didn't want to react badly mm-hmm. to it. So the Iranians never really... Certainly those in the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard Corps, didn't really see where the limits of the possible sort of uh, went off. I think now, because of, ironically, because in some ways of the quite sort of um, staunch reaction that Pompeo and Bolton yeah. has had, yeah. and the, there's a sort of feeling, you know, people will, will, will understand. I mean, there, there could have been other ways of doing it, by the way. You could have done it in a slightly quieter way. But nonetheless, uh, what's happened is I think the Iranians will then hold, take stock, have right. a look and see what's going on. Um, Interestingly, the Iranians have rarely gone over, you know, they've rarely gone over the limits that have been laid out. The key is, is that those red lines need to be made clear. Yeah. yeah they, you know, the danger, in a sense, when people say oh, we're in danger of tripping over into war or conflict. Mm. Well, the danger of tripping over into war and conflict is made all the more real when nobody knows where those tripwires are. Um, and I think that at the moment you are, as you've said, really in a situation where there'll be a bit of calm, a bit of consolidation, they'll review, they'll assess. But of course, you know, there's every possibility in a few months' time you may find them, you know, trying to push the, the boundaries again, trying to test, trying mm-hmm. to push, trying to, to find weakness. It's all part, in a curious sort of way, it's all part of a very protracted negotiation. And I use that term mm-hmm. in the broadest sense, you know, they're negotiating the relationship rather than negotiation. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Just a final question, and, and, and as briefly, if you can, if you can yeah. answer it. Do you think that there is really no natural way to conclude this in the sense that the Iranian, the Islamic Republic, the current regime, wants a nuclear weapon? Mm. And the, the, the sort of Western allies, if you like, don't want them to have a nuclear weapon. And that this is just a long, long game that you can't really see a natural conclusion. I think the critical difference I think I would have with people is I always say that the Iranians have always wanted to be in a position where they have the infrastructure right. to, 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 to break out if they right. choose it. I don't think they've ever really been bold enough in a sense to say, right, you know, very explicit, we want a nuclear weapon. Yeah. But they've always been interested in having the option. And this is something that the Shah used to say, and this is something I think the Islamic Republic has, has sort of uh, borrowed. I think far more serious in some ways is not so much the, the yearning to go for a nuclear weapon. It's this idea that they do talk about that we want to have an industrial-scale enrichment programme. Right. And the industrial-scale enrichment programme, of course, from the point of view of the West, is just as bad. because yes. I mean, you know, but, but that's what they're saying very publicly. And I think that's you know, quite disastrous and on many different levels. Um, and I think sooner or later, some sort of compromise will have to be reached. I think the West has to probably make very clear to them that they can have their enrichment programme, but for very, very limited research purposes only right. in that sense. And, you know, there'd be a quid pro quo, of course. I mean, there were certain things in the JCPOA which were very badly negotiated by the Iranians, actually, mm. not just by the West. 
and that was essentially their ability to integrate into the global economy and to have access to the US mm. financial markets. They never got that in the JCPOA, which is mm. why it was always very, very badly hampered. Mm. So in some senses, if you're going to put further restrictions on, which I think, you know, mm. the Europeans, and uh, they're all in concurrence on this, mm. you have to then offer certain other things. And this is why, in my view, by the way, that the thing has to be seen within a much broader perspective of what we've termed a grand bargain. Right. Excellent. Thank you so much. That's been, that's been great. Perfect. Great to speak to you. Great. Thank you very much. I'm now uh, delighted to be joined by Sanam Vakil, who's a senior research fellow at Chatham House um, and is a, one, one of the leading commentators on what's going on in Iran at the moment. Um, thank you for joining us, Sanam. Thank you for having me. Um, so I wanted to start off by really just asking you, right, in this period now where there is what the US calls sort of maximum pressure on Iran, we have tensions escalating in the Gulf um, and all sorts of uh, analysis of the various economic indicators of how the Iranian economy um, is being squeezed. And I wanted, first of all, if you could just give us a sense of like what, what is going on um, in Iran, how, how is that affecting day-to-day -day life in Iran and then how is that affecting sort of the regime and how, how it go, goes about doing its business? Um, from what I understand, um, of course, the maximum pressure campaign is um, hurting uh, average Iranians in quite a meaningful way. Uh, since uh, the sanctions were imposed, inflation has increased and uh, the IMF um, is predicting that it's uh, going to go um, up to about uh, 20 to 30 percent. GDP has declined uh, significantly. Um, Iran is effectively in, an, in a recession right now, and um, average Iranians are suffering not just because of high prices, but because um, people are losing their jobs or they're not getting paid on time. Um, and uh, there's just a lot of uncertainty um, alongside the fact that the currency has um, lost 100 percent of its value effectively um, as well. Um, so times are definitely tough um, for ordinary Iranians. Uh, prices of meat, medicine, um, food um, have increased. And um, this is, of course, quite a challenge for the government, which um, did try to prepare uh, for the impact of sanctions. Um, from what I understand, they um, purchased uh, a lot of medicine in advance from international companies. They made their payments and, and sort of tried to clear um, their payments well before the sanctions were um, implemented. Um, but still, uh, they can't sort of buffer against uh, some of the unknown economic uh, consequences. Um, so uh, times are definitely tough. But um, what we are, um, what is perhaps surprising for um, uh, some people is that uh, we have not seen an outpouring of protests and demonstrations as uh, some uh, policymakers had suspected or were concerned about. Um, and this is, um, from my reading, um, likely attributed to the fact that um, Iran has watched um, its regional neighbors um, descend into chaos and violence after the Iraq war, it's seen the um, emergence of ISIS, it's seen um, around the region the spread of uh, terror attacks, it's witnessed the Arab Spring, the Syrian civil war, and from, from far away they've also uh, watched the crisis in Venezuela. Uh, and, and the Iranian government has been very effective in uh, sort of messaging to, to the people that um, security and stability is much better than the uh, sort of uncertainty of unrest and, and the sort of consequences that emerge from these sort of crises. So is there, would you say, there's sort of a consensus that um, people know why things are happening because they are, because of this maximum sanctions from the US? So they, the, 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 it's not necessarily a case of economic mismanagement. It's a case of the, the regime doing a good job of making the people... Um, believe that there is a source of all this discontent and it's not them, it, it's coming from outside. Do you think they've been effective at trying to persuade people that? Well, I think the regime has been effective in, in blaming um, the United States and specifically the Trump administration uh, for the current crisis. But it, should, but it is not lost on people 
that uh, the Rouhani administration is also to blame and generally the economic planning and policies um, pursued by past Iranian presidents um, and a, sort of a general pattern of mismanagement is um, also um, and ultimately at the heart of this. So the interesting question around sort of the, the, the consensus on some of these issues is that, you know, we hear a lot of reports here about, you know, that, that there was some uh, uh, protest against sort of Iranian activities at, outside of Iran and money and supplies being provided to various groups and, you know, whether there was consensus around, for instance, like should Iran be investing so much money in Syria? Should it be giving loads of money to Hezbollah? And then we think about sort of the nuclear issue and the nuclear program. Do you think that there is a, a, a lot of support for those different elements? Like, is there less support for maybe what Iran's doing in the rest of the region, but maybe more support for the idea that Iran should have a nuclear program? How would you, how would you assess that? Mm, I mean, it's, of course, very hard to assess. We don't have accurate um, yes. data and polling. Um, but again, uh, based on my sort of anecdotal conversations and, and my reading of the press and interactions with um, policymakers and the like, I would say that Iranians have long been critical of the government's support for um, groups outside of Iran. Um, I remember years ago, people criticizing support for Hezbollah um, and uh, criticizing the government uh, for not repaving the roads and rebuilding the infrastructure after the Iran-Iraq war. So this has mm -hmm. been sort of a long-standing gripe and grievance that I don't think is ever going to go away. But what is interesting is that at the same time, and maybe with a different cohort of people, there has been a, a bit of an assessment um, maybe made um, that uh, Iran's strategy of forward defense, um, which is uh, about pushing Iran's threats as far away from its borders. And it does so through various means, but also through the support of proxy groups and non-state actors outside of its borders, has actually um, been a successful policy for the Islamic Republic. Um, and this idea is sort of gaining more traction um, now when uh, Iran is encircled and, and, and um, feeling threatened by the maximum pressure campaign, but also by regional hostility, specifically com coming from the Arab Gulf towards Iran. So, you know, there is nuance there. I, I, I couldn't say that one um, um, there is one dominant view in the country, but people are able to sort of parse out the differences. Um, mm. And then on the nuclear program, I would say that back in 2003, uh, when the nuclear issue emerged, um, I, I think Iranians had no idea uh, what the nuclear program was about or what even, you know, a centrifuge was or what uranium enrichment was about. But the government did a very um, good job over that 10 10-year 10 period in trying to cultivate a nationalist um, response uh, to um, the international community's targeting of Iran and denial of Iran. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that that has created greater awareness of uh, not necessarily public support with regards to the nuclear issue or having an indigenous nuclear program, but that Iran is uh, constantly targeted or deprived um, and there's a sense of injustice and nationalism mm. tied to these issues. Yeah, I've, 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 I've actually witnessed similar things speaking to refugees from North Korea and, and they express, even though they oppose the regime, they still express a similar kind of nationalist sentiment that like the nuclear program is an important part of, you know, the country being free to pursue, you know, it's, it's it, what, what it believes is rightfully it, it, theirs. And that, that's quite an interesting similarity. And um, I was going to ask a question about the regime itself and how potentially it, it maneuvers itself out of the current situation. And it seems that the rhetoric is going backwards and forwards, like, is there going to, there's going to be a war, there's not going to be a war, you know, Trump wants to talk, the Iranians don't want to talk, then the Iranians say, you know, maybe they will talk. I mean, do, do you think there is a point where there will be some kind of back channel and there'll be something discussed? And if so, then what is it that could potentially open things back up and get things moving? Will there be some kind of regime compromise here to either agree to some different kind of limitations on a nuclear program? Or is there something else that, that, that they can they can potentially offer? How do you see that? That's a very good question. I think that actually both um, the Trump administration and the Iranian government are um, both in internal discussions as what to mm. do. And I frankly wouldn't be surprised if the back channel has already started. Um, we've seen just a heightened level of international um, 
uh, mediation um, and engagement with Iran. Uh, so I think that there are many opportunities out there. Um, I think the problem specifically on the Iranian side is that um, there's a debate as to what is the correct strategy um, taking place. Should, um, should the Iranian government engage with Trump uh, before the 2020 elections and come mm. up with um, either a quick deal or um, begin uh, what could be a long negotiation process, or should they wait and gamble on the fact that maybe the president won't be reelected? Mm. So I think that that's one um, one debate that's taking place in the country. Um, with those in favor of discussions now, they see sort of um, Trump as um, maybe a, a president with a lot of bluster, but there's not a lot of um, deep uh, um, meaning behind his policy, and perhaps they could get a quick deal, and that quick deal could be maybe again some extension to the to the Iran nuclear agreement with again some minor concessions here or there, but not this grand bargain or not um, uh, any sort of capitulation along the lines of the 12 demands that were issued um, last year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are the sort of parameters that are being discussed um, in Iran. But there is a sense, I think, among um, the policy elite inside the country that I think they're deeply frustrated, they're angry. Um, and I think that um, there is a sense that they have tried to demonstrate accountability. They feel that you know they came and signed the JCPOA um, in, um, with good intentions and they remain committed to it. And so um, there's a lot of doubt as to whether this is the right administration to be making another deal with. Do you, do you think that, that that idea of waiting out Trump is, is sustainable? Because, I mean, first of all, there's a gamble that Trump won't win, and it's far from clear that, that he's not just going to win re-election. But that's, that, 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 that is speculation. But, I mean, even so, if you were to wait him out, that, that's like a year and a half of, of, of having to absorb this, this kind of situation. Do, do you think that, that, that the regime can do that? I think that uh, there there is a sense that they can run, you know, run a deficit and keep the country together, sort of on a tightened lockdown for the next right. year and a, you, on a year, for the next year and a half, definitely. But I, I mean, if I was giving them advice, I would say to deal now rather than deal later, because I think they're overestimating that maybe um, another president from the Democratic Party. Um, would would be an easy negotiator. I think that um, uh, the Iran file is a toxic file in Washington, and it's not as if um, uh, whoever w is going to be a contender can easily walk back into the JCPOA. That's going to um, open up uh, a wider portfolio of negotiations that, that the Iranian government has to be ready for. And perhaps in 2020, they're going to not have as much leverage as they do now, and they're going to um, be embarking on their own presidential election um, campaign, um, where uh, which will be held in uh, May or June of 2021. No, exactly. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us. That was some really interesting analysis of, kind of what, what's going on in Iran. Dr. Sanam Bakil, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me, James. It was a pleasure. By Emily Landau, who's the senior research fellow at the uh, Israeli Institute for National Security Studies, uh, head of the Arms Control and Regional Security Program, and, and I would say uh, one of one of the leading experts on the JCPOA and everything that's been happening with um, the Iranian nuclear program over the last few years. Thank you for joining us, Emily. Oh, it's my pleasure. So, BICOM has published this paper um, looking at Britain's Iran dilemma, and we're trying to really understand sort of what role the UK play and what are the immediate dangers of what's happening at the moment. And first of all, do you think that there's any that there's something that Iran might offer that will go beyond what's already in the JCPOA? What What do you think is the natural thing for them to try and offer to tighten up the JCPOA that that the US might accept as as progress? And they could say, look, yeah. you know. We put the pressure on, we got something in return, you know, we, we've sorted it. What do you think that might be? What Europe has been doing, you know, over the past year, trying to undermine the sanctions uh, that the U.S. has put in place, that's quite unfortunate. Um, mm. You know, in the name of saving the JCPOA, 
they've not only not joined the United States, but act, actually were actively trying to set up a system that would circumvent U.S. sanctions. So if the international community, if the strong international powers are not firm and committed to uh, basically forcing Iran's hand in this negotiation, it's not going to work. Iran won't offer anything. Iran likes the JCPOA because it's a pretty good deal for Iran. And that's why we see, by the way, even though the U.S. left the deal and many predicted that Iran would leave the deal in response, actually what we've seen over the past year is Iran holding on to the deal desperately because mm. they know that they're not going to get a better deal if the international negotiators are firm and committed um, the deal they're going to get is going to be a worse deal from their point of view but it's a, it's it's more like a game of arm wrestling than you know a political negotiation where there's a common goal that both sides want to reach and it's just a question of the price that each side will pay. Here, there's no common interest. Iran wants to keep its breakout capability, and the international community, certainly the United States, wants Iran not to have that breakout capability. So there's no middle ground here. And who is going to you know, win in this uh, dynamic, which, as I said, it's through talking, but it doesn't mean that force doesn't come into play. And mm. and this will take really a, a huge amount of commitment, which we see from the United States. I'm afraid we're not seeing from European states and certainly not from Russia and China. Just just a question on the on the European U.S. split. I think I think it's really important. But I mean, certainly th th there's a perception um, from from Britain and other countries that, that Iran was not breaking the JCPOA, that, that, that in terms of you know, the promised and hoped for behavior change, that there would be an end to sort of destabilizing activities in the region, that may well be taking place. But there, there was a feeling that in terms of the letter of the JCPOA, the Europeans and Britain didn't believe that Iran was in a kind of material violation. Um, so I just wondered what your thoughts are on that, because that, that seems to me to be at, at the heart of it. I mean, even, even Trump, when he yes. was talking about leaving the JCPOA, he mostly cited advanced ballistic missile program. Um, and he talked about, you know, uh, Iran's support of proxies in the region. He didn't talk all that much about breaking the letter of the JCPOA. So where, where in your view is Iran's violation of the letter of the JCPOA? And does that give us a clue to how we get back to uh, something like an agreement? The first thing I'll say before I get to the JCPOA is that indeed the JCPOA did not lead to all the things that the P5 plus one were expecting and certainly the Obama administration, right? We were hearing statements like, you know, after this deal, we'll be able to deal with Iran's ballistic program. We'll be able to deal with their malign activities across the Middle East. None of that happened. And expecting that to happen was totally naive because there was no basis for that hope. Iran doesn't want to stop its malign activities. And it has said, you know, a trillion times that it will not discuss its ballistic missile program. So where did the expectation come from that, you know, Iran would suddenly see the light and now they're going to talk about their ballistic missiles and malign activities? That was never a realistic expectation. But the JCPOA was sold on that basis. And going to the JCPOA, the question you raise is crucial. Because the problem is not that Iran was violating the JCPOA. Why would Iran violate a deal that is, is so good from mm. its point of view? Mm. The problem is that the deal legitimizes Iran's uranium enrichment program. That's ludicrous. The problem is they're allowed to work on advanced centrifuges under the terms of the deal. This mm. is after years in which the UN Security Council was slapping sanctions on Iran. Mm. Suddenly the deal legitimizes it. The inspections provision, grossly inadequate. A ballistic missiles not covered by the deal. The fact that the deal has an expiration date. So the problem is the deal itself. So if the deal is a bad deal for the international community, why would anybody find uh, you know, comfort in the fact that Iran is upholding a bad deal? So this is a, a, an argument that is used by JCPOA supporters, but it's totally irrelevant to the overall situation. The problem, as I said, is the provisions in the deal. 
And in earlier statements, Trump did talk about the inspection provisions. He's talked about the sunset uh, provisions. So he has related to the problems in the deal. Um, but the Europeans uh, responded mainly to the issue of ballistic missiles and malign activities in the region, two issues that are not covered by the deal. Although when Macron uh, spoke before the U.S. Congress last April, he did also mention some of the problems in the deal. So I, I think it's really important to, you know, not accept this argument that says, well, Iran wasn't violating the deal, so what's the problem? The problem is that the deal is bad. So if Iran is upholding a bad deal, I don't find that to be uh, any source of comfort. The final point I just want to mention is that there's this issue of the nuclear archives that uh, were taken from the heart of Iran. Original mm -hmm. Iranian plans for uh, building the IAEA has yet to conduct inspections on the basis of this massive amount of information about facilities, about scientists involved in the project, about activities undertaken, equipment that was used. And some uh, have the feeling that if this material is treated seriously, it might even turn out that Iran is continuing some of its nuclear weapons activities even till today. But before coming to that conclusion, all that material needs to be checked. The Iranians need to be confronted with, the, with a, a, all of the data there. And this has not happened, even though the IAEA has had the archives for over a year. Right. So you think that should be something that should be seriously focused on as, as we move forward? Seriously focused on uh, as soon as possible. I think the delay uh, can't be justified. And just final question. I mean, if, if you were advising sort of policymakers in, in the UK and looking ahead long term, in terms of the sunset clauses and the things that start to expire, because like even under the so the provisions of the deal, there are things that start to disappear in terms of quite important limit, arms limitations uh, on Iran and also on the nuclear program. What, what do you think is the most, the, the most alarming one that's coming up soon that you think people should be really thinking about? You know, what's the plan B? Because if we have the JCPOA to deal with them and then the deal says that those limitations, restrictions expire, well, what, what's the most important one that, that people should be focusing on and, and really paying attention to how they then deal with that in the future? What, what, what one rings alarm bells for you? Well, all of them, really. I mean, <laughs> the fact that this deal has an expiration date is yeah. a huge problem. Um, there are two concessions that uh, the P5 plus one made to Iran at the 11th hour, you know, sometime in uh, early July 2015. And these regard uh, its ballistic missile program and arms exports to Iran. And one of them expires in five years from when the JCPOA is implemented and the other in eight years. So these are yeah. uh, dates that are really coming up very quickly. Um, yeah. And in any case, Iran's ballistic missile program is not covered by the deal, but it is mentioned in a UN, a UN Security Council Resolution 2231, which sort of gives authority to the JCPOA. And even the weak provision that's in that uh, resolution uh, will no longer uh, be relevant once mm. we reach that date. And of course, mm. arms exports, the fact that Iran will be able to, you know, deal in arms with other countries is also a serious uh, source of concern. But of course, all of the nuclear provisions that between 10 and 15 years everything will sunset. And for decades, Iran was a member of the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and they were violating it. So again, that's not something that gives us uh, comfort. Iran has cheated, deceived, and lied for decades. And mm -hmm. uh, its lies have been, uh, you know, even in the nuclear archives, this is something that was revealed in one of the reports of the ISIS, that lists all of the lies that Iran told the IAEA about its program so that they don't, you know, show inconsistency with regard to their lies and deceptions. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that sort of uh, says it all about how Iran 
has conducted itself with regard to its nuclear program and uh, with regard to its really non-cooperation with the IAEA on this issue. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Emily. That's been a really fantastic overview. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, My pleasure. (laughs) Thank you. Bye. Bye.